Hey, I'm back with an update on my VIC-2 Kawari project, which is a replacement board for the Commodore 64 VIC-2 video chip. Uh, this is part five of the series, so if you want more background on how the project has evolved over the last year, please take a look at those videos on my channel. Uh, there was a lot of interest in the project since the last video. I sent a prototype to Adrian Black from Adrian's Digital Basement, and he put together a really nice video introducing the project to his viewers. Um, he tested the prototype and I got some good feedback and he pointed out some areas for improvement, so thanks to Adrian for doing that. Uh, since then I put together a PCB design for a single board and it arrived last week. And here it is. This is my over-engineered VIC-2 replacement board. This was fabricated for me by PCB Way. Uh, they did a pretty good job of putting this together. Um, this was the most complicated layout I ever put together and um, I was able to flash the bootloader, my loader program, and then flash the device with the bitstream and it pretty much worked the first time so I'm happy with that. Um, this actually does fit entirely inside the shield in my 250407 board although I've added a couple of extra sockets underneath this to give it some height so the HDMI connector can plug in without having to remove my RF modulator or the shield. Um, it's still too wide to plug directly in um, without the extra sockets, although I suppose if you squish down some components on the right side it could work. Um, I laid this out uh, with uh, KiCad. Uh, this version is still a development board, really. It has uh, a microcontroller and a USB connector and a few other components that don't really have to be on the final PCB. I have another design that removes those components and it will be less expensive than this was to make. That uh, microcontroller alone is a $15 part and uh, although it was useful for development, it really doesn't need to be there in the final design. Um, I think removing those components saves something like $20 in parts and I'm also working on reducing the size of this. Um, this could easily be half the size uh, if I switch, to FP, um, switch the FPGA to a BGA package. Uh, which is something like a quarter of the size of this package. Um, so unlike the prototype I sent to Adrian, this version will produce Luma and Chroma signals for the RF modulator. So you'll get Luma Chroma and Composite from the regular video out jack at the back of the machine. When I first started this project, my plan was to use a Composite encoder chip like the AD724. I actually put together a circuit using a Sony composite encoder IC and that's how I got my first images from this thing um, and although that does work like this can be reprogrammed to drive an external composite encoder the voltage levels for my Luma signals didn't match what the 64's RF modulator expected so I got a picture but it was very dark so I eventually came to the conclusion that I might as well invest the time to generate those signals directly from the FPGA. And a year ago I didn't think I would be able to pull that off, um, but I learned enough since then that I was able to uh, write my own Chroma Luma generation modules. So as it is, you can just plug this in, close up the machine, and, and be done if that's what you want. Uh, let's just take a quick tour of the board. There's a micro HDMI connector at the top. DVI is generated directly from the FPGA now, so there's no need for that HDMI adapter I was using before. Um, there's also a header on the right for analog RGB for a VGA connection, and that header should also support analog RGB for something like a 1084 monitor, although I haven't tried that out yet. Um, now, the main difficulty when using HDMI or VGA is that you need to figure out a way to get the cable out of a closed machine, and it also has to be like a safe way. What I mean by that is there needs to be some sort of strain relief in mind. Having a cable plugged directly into something socketed without some sort of strain relief as the cable exits the machine is just a disaster waiting to happen. You might pick up the machine, remove the power and joysticks and forget it's plugged into your monitor and start moving it and then yank it and do some damage to your socket or the board or both. So uh, one possibility to deal with the cable is to remove the RF modulator and replace it with one of these RF replacement boards which leaves the holes at the back of the machine free and a micro HDMI cable will fit through that hole. You can also use um, a short shielded cable and make your own VGA plug that plugs into say a 90 degree female header. Um, but again you really need to think about strain relief for those cables. 
Uh, moving on, there's a JTAG header on the right. Uh, at the bottom of the board, there's this USB connector for flashing the device and talking to the microcontroller through a serial program. But like I said earlier, that's going away. The, uh, the MCU is replaced by a single EEPROM for saving and restoring settings. But I wanted to at least have one of these fully loaded versions for myself. Um, and lastly, there is a reset line that hooks onto the CPU's reset pin. It's there for a couple reasons. One, to make sure the system stays in reset while the bitstream is loaded. And two, to reset the high-res video modes or put color registers back uh, to defaults if they've changed. But I'm pretty sure the final board will be able to load the bitstream in less time than it takes for the reset line to go high at startup. So this should be optional on the final PCB. And that is if you don't use any of the high-res modes you won't need the reset line or even if you do you can just power the machine on, on and off. Uh, this board supports all the features I developed for Vic2 Quarry. Uh, I made the core ridiculously configurable. Uh, here is a block diagram of all the components that go into Quarry. The colored boxes represent modules that are optional so depending on what you put on the board some features can be compiled in or out using uh, build flags so you can pick up any subset of video options you see here. You can leave out all the high-res stuff if you want. Uh, these yellow boxes represent how the board saves settings. Uh, the dev board uses an MCU, but that can be swapped for an EEPROM, like I said before, or you can leave it off entirely and then nothing will be saved. Um, the reason I made these configurable is because I wanted options for smaller and cheaper boards. So the top line is the board I have. I've also designed a less expensive board by taking out the MCU and using an EEPROM. And as you go down the list, you can start taking away other video options or even the ability to switch PAL and NTSC until you get down to just the FPGA plus transceivers and some resistors. And that last one could be a simple drop-in replacement, especially if you use a BGA package. So how to generate Luma and Chroma signals? Um, as I mentioned, my design can now generate these signals, so Composite Out still works with this plugged in. Um, here's what it looks like on my TV, and I'm sorry for the roll my camera doesn't capture it exactly 60 hertz. Um, it's not bad, but I think it can be improved. Uh, here's what it looks like on my LCD composite monitor. Um, <clears throat> I wrote this composite editor that lets me adjust the Luma levels, phase angles, and amplitude for the Luma chroma signals. And I meant to use this to adjust the signals so that they match the real 6567, 6569 levels as close as possible. But unfortunately, my oscilloscope broke recently, and I haven't been able to do that just yet. Um, there seems to be some ghosting going on. You can see there are some shadows after the characters on dark to light transitions. Um, there's a hint of jail bars in there, uh, not so much visible on my TV, but a little bit more on the, um, the LCD composite monitor. Um, not sure if that's avoidable, but it's not too bad anyway. Uh, anyway, I'll, look, I'll work on improving that. Uh, I searched around and could not find any HDL implementations of Chroma Luma generation, so I had to write all this myself. Uh, once this is available, I think uh, it can serve as a good example for other projects on how to do it. Um, the Luma signal determines the brightness of each phosphor element that glows as the electron beam scans across the screen. So the higher the voltage, the brighter the phosphor glows. The Luma signal also includes the horizontal and vertical sync pulses that tell the CRT when each line ends and when each frame ends so the beam can go back to the beginning of a line or a frame. Uh, now, I already worked out the sync signals because I needed those to feed those into that composite encoder circuit I mentioned before. So all I really needed to, to do is to generate the, um, the voltage levels. And generating this kind of signal is actually not that difficult. It's just a matter of looking up a table between the color index, so 0 to 15, of whatever pixel is coming out of the pixel sequencer, and some luma level. And a luma level translates to a voltage level now the number of luma levels in the later revisions of the VIC-2 chips were uh, 9. This is how they're distributed over the 16 colors and earlier versions you can see at the bottom had only 5 luma levels and there was a different distribution but the idea is the same. Um, even though there are 9 luma levels I decided to use 6 bits in my DAC uh, so Kawari can support up to 64 luma levels. and. Um, 
the only reason I did that was to be able to match the genuine levels as, as best I could, and I thought six bits of accuracy would be more than enough to do that. So really, it's a, a color index that maps to a number from 0 to 63, which goes through a DAC and becomes a voltage between 0 and 5 volts. So getting a black and white image was pretty quick uh, to get work, working. Now the chroma signal is a different story. The chroma signal is a modulated sine wave whose amplitude and phase is used to determine the position on a color wheel. And the color wheel is different for NTSC and PAL, but the idea is the same. The phase, which is basically how much the wave is shifted left or right, determines the, um, the angle and the amplitude determines how far out from the center you are on that wheel, which is the saturation. To generate this signal, I wrote a small Java program first to generate 15 amplitude levels of a sine wave. And each wave you see there is 256 values between 0 and 511, so that's 9 bits. Uh, then it was a matter of mapping color index to a 4-bit amplitude value and 8-bit phase shift, and which is the angle, where 0 to 255 represents an angle between 0 and 359 degrees. My clock is 16 times the dot clock, which means for every pixel I have 16 ticks on the time axis and 64 positions on the voltage axis to produce, produce a wave. Um, the wave comes from picking the 256 entry table using the amplitude selection and starting at the phase angle 0 to 256 and then counting up by 16 each tick and then that covers one full period of the wave for each pixel. So it turns out the uh, color voltage levels were not so critical so 3.3 volt swings seems to be good enough. Uh, so I didn't need a level converter uh, for the color. Um, that in a nutshell got me Luma and Chroma signals and those are mixed by the RF modulator as usual and the video comes out the normal video port at the back of the machine. Um, I've also tried this uh, LCD monitor and upscaler and it seems to be okay but I think uh, the quality can probably be improved a bit. Um, now one thing that ends up being weird about having registers that can change colors is that now RGB based video output has no effect on phase amplitude based video so I'll show you what I mean. I have both HDMI and composite hooked up here at the same time. I also have an RGB editor and if I adjust the black level here so it looks red you can see that shows up on the HDMI output but it has no effect on the composite. And if I do the same from the Luma Chroma Editor, say I change this purple to something more red or orange, you can see that the effects, uh, this affects composite, but then not the HDMI. So this makes things a little weird because my intention was to allow programs to change colors. Um, I know RGB can be converted to the other color uh, scheme and vice versa, but I'm not going to do that in Verilog, so I might end up rethinking that whole color register thing. So uh, in my last video, I demoed an 80 column mode and I ended up adding a hardware back block copy and fill support, which makes scrolling much quicker. It's actually faster to scroll now in 80 column mode than it was uh, than it is in 40. Um, here's an example of what that used to look like and sorry for the very blurry video here, but this is just to show you how slow the scroll used to be. <clears throat> And uh, this is what it looks like now using the hardware acceleration. And that block copy fill acceleration can be used to manipulate uh, video memory. So that's the 32K that I added. Uh, but I mostly did it to make 80 column mo mode more snappy and it worked out great. Um, and in case you're wondering, 80 column mode does work on composite, but it's barely legible. The bandwidth is just much too high for, um, for NTSC or PAL. It probably looks slightly better using an S-Video cable, but it's not really meant for composite. Um, finally, someone emailed me after my last video and suggested that I write uh, a Novaterm driver for my 80 column mode. And Novaterm is or was uh, a popular telecom program for the C64. One of the cool things about it was that it supports pluggable video drivers and uh, included in an 80 column driver for people who had the Commodore 128 in 64 mode. It also had a soft 80 driver for the C64, but those were kind of hard to see, especially on the TV. Um, <clears throat> so here is what Novaterm's soft 80 driver looks like. 
but now I can go to the configuration menu, select 80 column driver and uh, Kawari driver will show up. This is just a single file you add to the Novaterm disk and it'll show up. Uh, now I can go to the terminal and press Commodore C and you get a nice sharp 80 column display. Um, and I also bought one of these uh, Wi-Fi user port modems and I'll just dial into a, a BBS here just to show it working against a real server. So this turned out great because it actually led me to implement additional features. If you select uh, VT102 terminal mode, many of the ANSI escape sequences will work, like blinking text. Uh, underline text. Reverse video. and the uh, color escape codes. And since the color palette is configurable, my driver installs uh, the, the ANSI color palette, which means things like color intensity will also work. And one of the things the viewer was interested in was having not only an 80 column driver, but one that could support the higher baud rates. And the problem with the regular drivers was that the scrolling ended up taking so many CPU cycles that flow control kicked in and you wouldn't get the full baud rate your modem could do. But with the Quarry driver, that shouldn't be a problem since the scrolling is accelerated now. So what's next? Uh, people have been asking when this is going to be available, and I, I'm sorry, I'm rather slow with this hardware stuff, so I still don't know, but I think one more revision to the board design ought to do it. I'm going to try and make it smaller and cheaper, like I said earlier. I have enough parts to make uh, 10 and I'll send out some of these for testing and evaluation and then we'll see what it takes uh, to make more. Um, I'll have to decide whether I'm actually going to produce these or just put it all, all on GitHub or something. Uh, don't really know yet but I imagine sometime later this year and I want this project to be done. Uh, anyway, thanks uh, for watching. This is where I'm at with the project and uh, hopefully I'll have a design finalized uh, by my next update.